Welcome to Back to the Bible. Hi, I'm Woodrow Kroll, and along with Tammy Weiser, there are some folks who have joined us in our studio today. This is Thursday. Thank you for joining me as well. Now, unless you're driving a car right now, let me encourage you to get your Bible and kind of get comfortable, because for the next half hour or so, we're going to spend that time in God's Word discussing the book of Revelation. Tammy, yesterday we talked a little bit about the preterist view of Revelation, that everything in Revelation is already past. It's already occurred, A.D. 70, all these things happened. Today we're going to look at the variations of understanding by futurists, those who say all these things are still yet to happen. It seems like there are quite a few views on when Jesus is going to come again, Mm -hmm. which leads me to the question, does it really matter that we know? Because isn't the important thing that we do know that he is coming again, not so much when? Yeah, that's kind of like asking, does it matter if I know, uh, if I'm a kid now, does it matter if I know my mother's coming home at 9 o'clock or coming home at 7 o'clock? If my mother's coming home at 9 o'clock, I have two more hours to do whatever I want to do. If she's coming home at 7 o'clock, I better whip myself into shape and get the room cleaned up because, you know, I have an understanding of future events. Is it important when Christ comes back? Well, none of us knows for sure, but one of the reasons, remember the other day, we said one of the reasons you study prophecy is to help you have a holy life. Those who believe these things, it says, will live in purity and godliness. And so I think one of the reasons why it's important for us at least to get some sense of when the Lord might come back is because that bears on how we live our lives right now. But today we want to talk about the futurist view. Yesterday, the past view, the preterist view. There are variations of the preterist view just as there are variations of the futurist view. And I want to just throw out some of these variations, and we're going to get through these quickly because we want to get to the stuff of Revelation. But before we get to the stuff of Revelation, we have to talk about what is our angle going to be? What is our take on Revelation? Well, how are we going to interpret the book? And that's why we're spending this time today. Let me suggest to you some of the beliefs that have come down to us through a number of years with regard to how to understand the future. One of them is called the partial rapture view. And basically, the partial rapture view is that only spiritual Christians, only spiritual believers who are watching and waiting for the Lord's return, they are alone going to be raptured when the Lord comes back and takes us home to be with him. If you're not ready, if you're not spiritual, if you're not watching, you have to wait. Now, what do you wait for? Well, you wait to go through a portion of the tribulation, at least, to purify you, to get you where you should have been when Christ came back. Now, here's the problem, as I understand it, with this view. And by the way, this view is based on interpretations of Scripture, Matthew 24, verse 13. It's based on an interpretation of Luke 21, 36, based on Philippians 3, 20, uh, 2 Timothy 4, 8. I mean, folks who hold to this view have reasons why they hold to it. I don't hold to this view, and here's the reasons why I don't. I think the partial rapture view conditions the privilege of participating in the rapture on works. It conditions the privilege of being taken to heaven on what you do to stay ready constantly to go to heaven. Uh, I think that ignores the sufficiency of Christ's atonement. As a result, I think it violates the concept of the unity of the body of Christ. We are not all as mature as we ought to be. In fact, uh, you've heard me quote Vance Havner again and again and again. I just love this quote. He said, how long you've been a Christian only tells how long you've been on the road. It doesn't tell how far you've come. Well, there are lots of Christians who have been on the road a long time. They just haven't come very far. But if only those who have gone a long way on the road to spiritual maturity are caught up to meet the Lord in the air, what does that do to the rest of the body that is left behind? It's like a dismembered body. I don't think the partial rapture view is the correct view. There are others who say, no, 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 there is going to be a tribulation, and God is going to send his son to rapture us at the end of the tribulation. This is called the post-tribulational rapture view. Basically, this says that the Lord will return, he's going to remove his church, but he'll do that at the end of the tribulation period, just before the second coming of the Lord Jesus at the Battle of Armageddon. Now, this view is based on an interpretation of Scripture, Matthew 13, verses 24 to 30. 
But I think this view fails to distinguish between the church's suffering at the hands of man's hostility and the wrath of God that's going to come on this earth that is not a part of man's hostility. This is the wrath of God. And the Bible clearly indicates we are not destined for God's wrath. And as a result of that, I think it overlooks the absence of the resurrection event in Revelation chapter 19. So I think the post-tribulational view, while it commends itself to a number of people, probably fails the test of what Scripture is all about. I choose not to align myself with that view. There's another view that says, no, 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 it's not at the end of the tribulation, it's halfway through the tribulation. So we've had the partial rapture view, we've had the post-tribulational view, this is the mid-tribulational view. Now this is a kind of a clever view. It says that the church will be raptured in the middle of the tribulation, after the first three and a half years, but before the second three and a half years. Tribulation period is seven years long. First half, three and a half years, bad stuff, but really bad stuff happens in the second half. So believing that church saints will not be exposed to God's wrath, that's the second half of the tribulation, this view says that they'll be translated to heaven before the judgments of God that come from the bowls. So basically, they'll be translated to heaven somewhere in about uh, Revelation 16. Now, here's what I see as a problem here. The mid-tribulationist identifies the last trump call of God, 1 Corinthians 15, with the blowing of the seventh trumpet of Revelation chapter 11. But the context is entirely different there. One of them is a call to come up to heaven. The other is a call for judgment upon the earth. And here's what I think they have completely overlooked. They've overlooked the whole concept of Revelation 15 verse 1 that says divine judgment is now ended. Divine judgment is finished. This has been a period of God's wrath, and they're saying there is wrath to come, so the church has to be taken out before it. But God's wrath has been on the earth for three and a half years already, just not as stringent as it's going to be in the future. Basically, I think the mid-tribulation view disregards the fact that the trumpet's signal various events throughout the future, they kind of lump them all together, and they say that when that trump is blown of the seven trumpet judgment, then God will take up his people to heaven. But we have to go through a little wrath before we get to the great wrath. That leaves one other futurist view, and that is the pre-tribulational view, the pre-tribulational rapture view. This is a view that has been popular for a lot of years, but has fallen on hard times in the last few years. Now, granted, this is the view taken by a very popular series of books called the Left Behind series. But it's a view that is sometimes ridiculed, and certainly not believed, by those who are of Reformed theology or those who are the preterist view. And those of us who are pre-tribulationalists have really taken a hit in the head the last number of years. Uh, Hit in the head is okay. If, in fact, this is the way the Bible should be interpreted. Now, I'm going to interpret the Bible this way, not because I don't understand the other positions. In fact, I was educated in the other positions. I'm a pre-tribulationist, pre-millennialist today, because I think it best fits the facts, not because that's my training and my background. Now, a pre-tribulationist says the church in its entirety is going to be cut up out of the world before the tribulation comes, before the 70th week of Daniel, before all these things happen upon the earth. God says, I have kept you from that hour. And the pre-tribulational view then says, this means that Jesus Christ has to come back, and he can come back at any time. Take us out before all these events unfold. Now, someone says, but what about all those signs? All those signs relate to events that occur after the rapture of the church. So what should I look forward happening before Jesus comes back? Increased earthquakes? Disease? Pestilence? The rise of the Antichrist? No, none of those things. That's why I think it's appropriate to believe in the imminent return of the Lord, that he could come back at any time. In fact, Wouldn't it be great if he came back before we finished this series on Revelation and he could correct all the things I got wrong? (laughs) Well, there is another alternative. He could correct all my friends who got it wrong. 
Mary, you have a question. (laughs) Yes. As a mother and grandmother, I constantly think of the younger generation and so on, and and the importance of knowing about prophecy and to study prophecy. A lot of children and younger adults think that it is not applicable in their lives. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's good that we try to reach them to let them know how important it is for them now. Yeah. In fact, Mary, there are some teenagers who are very interested in prophecy because this is their future. I mean, you know, they see us as relics of the past, but the future is important to them. So there are a lot of teens that really relate to the whole Left Behind series, for example, or relate to the book of Revelation. But you're right. There isn't a time period in our lives when the Bible is not important to us. Well, just a bit. I want to come back and talk with you seriously about the question, are there things to come? Yesterday, I questioned the belief that everything has already been taken care of. A.D. 70, that's it. Everything about the book of Revelation is past. That's the preterist view. I had some questions about that. Today, I want to ask the question, is there anything yet to come in the future? I'll be back in just a minute. More in a moment with Dr. Kroll here on Back to the Bible. You know, people try all kinds of things to figure out the future. Psychic hotlines and horoscopes, even fortune cookies. It's amazing how desperate people are to know what's going to happen. But the truth is, the only reliable place to learn about the future is the Bible. This summer, Dr. Kroll is talking about Bible prophecy, and specifically in the book of Revelation, and he's written a brand new Bible study called The Glorified Christ that you can use as you follow along with his messages and for your own personal study of Revelation. The Glorified Christ is totally user-friendly, and it's like a tour guide that'll take you through the tough book of Revelation, explaining the sights and the sounds, and it uses easy-to-understand language. So if you've ever wanted to understand Revelation better, you need the glorified Christ. Now you can get the glorified Christ Bible study with your gift of any amount to Back to the Bible. So call us toll free at 1-800-759-2425. That's 1-800-759-2425. Or, of course, you can send your gift to Back to the Bible, Box 82808, Lincoln, Nebraska, 68501. Again, that's Back to the Bible, Box 82808, Lincoln, Nebraska, 68501. Or you can log on anytime to backtothebible.org. Now let's go back to Wood. Well, let's go to the Bible, find out what it has to say. Matthew 24, I've referenced this passage all week long. We've read from it a couple of times. Matthew 24, verse 14 says this, And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. Now, I'm assuming this is a credible source who said this, because it's in red in my Bible which means these are the words of Jesus. If Jesus says the gospel will be preached to the ends of the world, all the world will hear the gospel before the end comes, and the end came in A.D. 70, I wonder how the Native American, the Eskimo, the people of the Far East feel about that. Because the gospel hadn't reached all around the world by A.D. 70. So are there things yet to come? I think the answer is yes. And you know what? Our generation, now this may not be the generation in which Jesus comes back. I don't know that for sure. But think about our generation. In our generation, the Jesus film, for example, has pretty well encompassed the entire globe. In our generation, who would have ever thought, even a few years ago, that a guy like Mel Gibson could make a movie and millions of people would flock to see The Passion of the Christ, not only in America and the Western world, but the rest of the world too. In our generation, who would have ever believed before our generation that I could stand here before you in a study group in Lincoln, Nebraska, And others would join us at home, like you folks at home and you people in your cars. Who would have thought that my voice in Lincoln, Nebraska, could be heard in India, in Africa, in England, in South America, all over the world? This is astounding to me. This was not possible 
before our generation. And the Internet? Don't get me started. Imagine how quickly the gospel can get to the corners of the earth. So when Jesus says this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come, I pay attention to little things. He says, then the end will come. The end did not come before the first part of this verse was fulfilled. I think it's still future. Let's go to another passage, a corollary passage to this. Luke chapter 21 at verse 21. Luke 21, 21 has something to say about the future as well. This is what it says. Then let those in Judea flee to the mountains. Let those who are in the midst of her depart. Let not those who are in the country enter her. For these are the days of vengeance and all things which are written may be fulfilled. Woe to those who are pregnant. And to those who are nursing babies in those days, for there will come great distress in the land and wrath upon the people. They will fall by the edge of the sword and be led away captive to all nations. Jerusalem will be trampled by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Now, let me stop there. Because I could be a preterist on the basis of those verses if it weren't for that last clause. You know, I could understand all that having taken place in 70 A.D. Except this whole business of the times of the Gentiles. The times of the Gentiles did not stop in 70 A.D. In fact, the Gentiles trampled over Jerusalem for generation after generation after generation until the Jewish people took the city of Jerusalem in 1967 in the Six-Day War. And I think that's when the times of the Gentiles stopped. Are the Gentiles still in Jerusalem? Yeah, I'm there every year, and I'm Gentile. There are Gentiles who live in the city of Jerusalem. But the Gentiles aren't in control of the city of Jerusalem like they were for many hundreds, even thousands of years. The times of the Gentiles I don't see as occurring in 70 A.D. I think those are still future events, and we may be right in the thick of things right now. Let me take you to one other passage, and then we'll close for today. 2 Peter chapter 3. This is an interesting passage. You're familiar with this. 2 Peter chapter 3, talking again about the future, and specifically what's going to happen in the future that relates to this old world today. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 1. Beloved, Peter says, I now write to you this second epistle, that you may be mindful of the words which are spoken before by the holy prophets and the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Peter says, look, I'm writing to you for two reasons. I want you to remember what the prophets of the Old Testament said, and I want you to remember what the apostles of the New Testament said. Knowing this, he says, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this, they will willfully forget that by the word of God, the heavens of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water, but the heavens and the earth which now exist are kept in store by the same word reserved for judgment until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Now I want to be honest here. A preterist could look at that passage and say, it's done. It's all done. Everything that's said in that passage occurred in AD 70. I would agree. Everything that's said could have occurred in AD 70. I would also say, though, that everything that's said in that passage could still be future. I'll give you the potential it's maybe past. If you'll give me the potential, it's maybe not past. Now, here's why I think it's maybe not past. Peter prophesied that there would be people who would deliberately forget that the heavens and the earth, the term defined in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, the heavens and the earth would remain consistent throughout all generations. There are people who say that the old heavens represent the old covenant. The new heavens represent the new covenant. As the old heavens have passed away, so did the old covenant pass away. 
As the new heavens have come, so the new covenant has come. You see where I'm going with all this. A preterist says, just as we're living under the time of the new covenant, we're living under the time of the new heavens. And there is nothing future. It's all now. This is the kingdom of God. This is the new heaven promised in the book of Revelation. And I say to you, my preterist friends, I am really disappointed that this is the new heaven. You know, I thought for sure it'd be better than this. I thought for sure I wouldn't have to pay taxes when I got to heaven. I thought for sure I wouldn't have to take the dog for a walk when I got to heaven. You know, I thought for sure all my relatives would love me dearly when I... If this is heaven, I am sorely disappointed. Now, I'll give you the fact that the potential is there that these verses all relate to something past. I just ask you to give me the fact that the potential is there. They all relate to the future. Now, tomorrow, we're going to talk specifically about the future and what we can understand from the book of Revelation that is important to you today. I'm going to give you tomorrow five reasons why I am a premillennialist. I'm a futurist. I think the best is yet to come. I also think the worst is yet to come, but I trust God enough to know how to make the worst into the best for his people. Terry, you have a comment. We had a pastor one time that, uh, as he preached, he always preached uh, Mm post-tribulation rapture. Mm -hmm. And then he made a comment one time about pre. And so I asked him, what do you actually believe? He said, oh, I believe adamantly in pre-tribulation rapture. (laughs) But that's not what you teach. He says, no, it's safer. Aha. One of the great things about preterism is it's safe. You know, you don't have to go out on a limb to interpret anything if you say everything's past. The problem with that is there are just lots of things in the book of Revelation I can't find in history. And there are lots of things about today that don't appear to me that they are the way they're described in the Bible as future. And it's more pragmatic than anything, I suppose. I just don't see any system fitting the facts as well as the premillennial system does. So you've got the Antichrist, the number 666, violence, horrible plagues and wars. Kind of sounds like I'm talking about the latest release from Hollywood. Actually, all of these things and a lot more are found in the book of Revelation. Dr. Cole's taking us on an interesting journey through Revelation this summer here on Back to the Bible. And we want you to get as much as possible from Wood's messages. And that's why we're offering Dr. Cole's brand new Bible study called The Glorified Christ. The Glorified Christ is a must-have if you're looking for a clear and complete understanding of Revelation. And it's full of easy-to-understand language, and it has some great insights. So call us today and ask for The Glorified Christ Bible Study, and then follow along with Wood as he takes us on a journey through the incredible last book of the Bible. You can get your copy of the Glorified Christ Bible Study with a gift of any amount to Back to the Bible. So to order this study, call us at 1-800-759-2425. That's 1-800-759-2425. Or visit our website. It's backtothebible.org. And of course, we do still accept mail from the post office. So if you prefer, send your support to Back to the Bible, Box 82808, Lincoln, Nebraska, 68501. Again, that's Back to the Bible, Box 82808, Lincoln, Nebraska, 68501. Now let's go back to Wood. Well, we have a lot of big things planned here at Back to the Bible. You know, we're starting new ministries in new cities and new countries all the time, and there's just so much more to be done. But it never gets done without your help. That's why I'm here to thank you for being a partner with us. Now, you know that we're a listener-supported ministry, so if you appreciate what you hear on this broadcast, if you appreciate knowing that others get to hear it too, and you want to be a part of all of that, Give us a call today. Add your support to Back to the Bible. You can call us toll-free at 1-800-759-2425. That's 1-800-759-2425. 
Well, tomorrow we're going to continue thinking about revelation in the future. Is there a future for us in this world? And does the Bible have something to say about your future? That's our topic of discussion here tomorrow on Back to the Bible. Come by and join us again. Thanks for being here today. God bless you. I'm Woodrow Kroll. Have a good and godly day.